I've taught through the book of Philippians several times, um, but I have to confess that this time I am seeing things and reading things and learning things that I've never been aware of before. And I pray that there's something in all of this series this summer that really strikes you, that, that would be life transforming for you in some way. Um, I know it's happening to me, so I pray the Holy Spirit is doing that with you as well. So let's kind of move into the text. I want to share a little bit. Uh, Mom and dad provided their daughter with everything they thought she needed to become a strong, beautiful young woman. So it was quite a shock the first time they discovered that she was taking large numbers of their old prescription medications in the cabinet. She was 12 years old when they found out. Mom and dad, of course, immediately removed all of their old prescriptions and pledged to love and encourage their daughter even more. But sadly, things did not get better. She quickly moved on to alcohol and marijuana. And by the time she was in high school, her drug of choice was meth. Counselors and treatment programs were put in place. Clear expectations, more treatment programs, and even more love were provided. However, the downward spiral was fast, it was uncontrollable, and it was insane. Mom and dad felt helpless. Many days they felt utterly hopeless. There were lots of tears shed in the dark of night. They tried everything, and they tried everything countless times, but nothing seemed to work. They watched as their daughter, the daughter they loved so much, destroyed her life. At the age of 23, her body could not take it anymore. She died alone and empty and desperate. The funeral for this young woman was extraordinarily difficult. Family and friends were heartbroken, as you can imagine, because the, the person they loved never achieved her potential, never lived into her dreams, never reached maturity. The Apostle Paul watches the same thing happening to people that he loves who are in the church at Philippi. In verse 19, Paul writes, Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. And then here's the key. Their minds are set on earthly things. Paul is heartbroken. He knows the path that many in the church at Philippi are following will never lead them to maturity. And when Paul thinks about their self-destructive attitudes and behaviors, tears come to his eyes. In verse 18, he writes this, And now I tell you, even with tears, many of us understand Paul's sadness. Because we have family and friends whose choices are leading them away from the very things that will bring them love and peace and joy and hope. Our hearts are broken too. Because someone we love is not choosing to grow into maturity. And we're fearful of where their choices will lead. Now the good news in this text this morning is there are some things that Paul shares with us that will help us to develop spiritual and relational maturity. So I just want to pick up on a couple of these. The first one is to seek out encouragers. To seek out encouragers. Maturity increases when we grow healthy and holy relationships with other people and when we grow a healthy and holy relationship with Jesus. However, what Paul points out to us is we're never going to develop this relational and spiritual maturity unless we rely on other people. Listen to verse 17. My friends... I want you to follow my example. We need someone who is ahead of us a little bit whose example is, well, they're becoming 
more spiritually and relationally mature. So my friends, I want you to follow my example, but then listen to this. And learn from others who closely follow the example we set for you. So we need the example, but we also need to commit ourselves to learning from others. If I want to grow mature in my life and in my faith, I will seek out other people who will encourage me. But I, I need something from them because not just any kind of encouragement will do. Paul says we need to surround ourselves with people who are of the same mind. I surround myself with people who are becoming themselves more relationally and spiritually mature. Now, this is not an easy thing. Seeking out the right people involves careful and prayerful discernment. I need the Holy Spirit to help me to choose this example and those encouragers in my life. And Paul addresses this pretty straightforward. Earlier in this same letter, Paul writes to the people at Philippi and he says there are dogs, and we're not talking about the little cuddly furry ones, we're talking about people here. There are dogs and evil workers in the church who are not concerned about our spiritual or relational health. Jesus himself says there are wolves in sheep's clothing in our midst who will do and say things that undermine our relational and spiritual health. Over in Galatians, Paul's writing to a whole group of churches in a region called Galatia. Paul warns us about those in the churches who pervert the gospel. In our text this morning, Paul warns us that there are those in the church who are enemies of the cross of Christ. So we just can't go to anybody, can we? We need the Holy Spirit to help us to discern who is the example that will help me to develop this relational maturity and this spiritual maturity. Who is that? And to rely upon them. Paul talks about so many people who claim that Christ is their Savior. And he says in verse 19 of the text, all they can think about are the things of this world. We don't need that kind of example, do we? We need somebody who is really maturing in their faith, who is really healthy in their relationships. It's helpful to seek out two or three people like this, who are growing in their love of Jesus and healthy in their relationships because they become not only an example, but they also become an encourager for us. They can also teach us. They can also support us along the way. So I want to invite you to look around the church this morning and see, is there someone here? Is there someone here who is ahead of you just enough maybe in their relationship with Jesus, or maybe in their relationships with other people? Is there someone here today who is ahead of you just enough that they could show you, that they could teach you, that they could be an example to you about how to continue to mature? I want you to imagine something. If you have somebody in mind, imagine sharing a cup of coffee with that person this week. If you don't like coffee, then imagine sharing a piece of coconut cream pie with them, okay? Just whatever kind of brings a little joy, okay? And then imagine if you would ask that person, if the two of you could get together about once a month and that the focus of your conversation could be letting them encourage you, letting them teach you, letting them support you and continue in continuing to grow towards maturity in your relationship with Jesus or in your relationship with other people. Now, if, if one-on-one is a little too, like, intimate for you, then I would encourage you to try this. Ask that person 
if they would be willing for the two of you to gather around another four or five people and that you would become a small group that maybe once every couple of weeks or so would get together and talk about the things that would help you in your relationships to grow more mature or in your relationship with Jesus to grow more mature. This is so important. Seek out encouragers. This is what I know. When you go to work tomorrow, there can be someone there who will discourage you, okay? Even in our own homes, some days there's someone there who could discourage us by something they say or something they do. So we need someone in our life outside of our family, outside of our workplace, outside of our team, outside of our school, who can encourage us in these things. I've had somebody that I have been in this relationship with. Uh, she's uh, a bit older than I am. She's extraordinarily bright, very well informed on spiritual things, very mature in her relationship with Christ. I have been uh, visiting with her, as I'm recommending for you, for over 20 years. In July, she had the audacity to tell me that she's retiring. I couldn't believe it, you know? I couldn't believe it because what it means now is I have to do the same thing that I believe Jesus is calling all of us to do. I have to go out and find another person to fill that role in my life. And I'm going to begin by asking the Holy Spirit to help me find the kind of person who is spiritually mature and in their relationships mature, who could coach me or teach me or support me or encourage me. So first, first, seek out encouragers. Second, expect Jesus to show up. I think it's extraordinarily easy for Christ followers in our culture today to lose sight of the end goal in life. Let me read for you from Philippians 3, verse 20. Uh, Paul here is calling the church in Philippi to refocus on what is most important. And this is what he says. But our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This one little statement is so full, so full. Our citizenship is in heaven. Most of us assume that we are citizens of the world. But Paul says that we're citizens of heaven first. That's the end goal. And between now and then, we're expecting a Savior whose name is Jesus. So our hope, our expectation is that Jesus is coming. Now here's what most of us would profess is true. That when we die, we're expecting Jesus to come and meet us and have us in heaven with him for all eternity. But are we expecting Jesus to show up in worship today? Are we expecting Jesus to show up in our family today? Are we expecting Jesus to show up tomorrow at work or next week at school? Do we really expect Jesus to show up in our lives? That's part of the end goal. You know, as Christians, we say that we believe that Jesus lived and that he died and that he was raised up again. But if we really believe, if we really believe that Jesus was raised from death to life, what that means is he will show up in our life today. He'll show up in our worship today. He'll show up. He'll show up. Do we expect the risen Christ to really show up in the midst of what we're going through right now, whatever that may be. Our, our focus is on the end goal. The end goal is to live in eternity with Jesus, but it's also to live with him right now. That's the end goal. Are we expecting Jesus to show up? There's a, a book, it's a little bit old right now, The Seven uh, Habits of Highly Effective People, written by Stephen Covey. One of his primary points in the book is this, that all, 
not some, all highly effective people develop the discipline to begin with the end in mind. What if we began every day with the end goal in mind? Covey explains that clearly seeing the end goal before we set out to reach it is a difference between those who achieve the goal and those who don't. For Paul, the end goal is the coming of Jesus. Growing in relational and spiritual maturity occurs when we remain focused on the goal of living with Jesus now and in eternity and then surrounding ourselves with people who will encourage us on that journey. We, today, are expecting Jesus to show up and to make a difference in our lives. Let us pray. Jesus, you showed up and you walked the streets of little towns and farms all through what we know as Jerusalem and Israel. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for showing up then. But when you were, when you were raised from death to life again, the promise was that you would show up in our lives every single day and the, your purpose was not just to save us a place in eternity, but it was to help us to grow up into your likeness, to grow up into your love today. And so Jesus, we are expecting you to show up in our life. And for some of us, our hearts are broken today. For some of us, there's this sadness in our life. There's this loneliness in our life. There's this emptiness in, li in our life. But Jesus, we are expecting you to show up in our life and to change our life so that we might continue to, to mature in our relationship with you, but also in our relationships with other people. So Jesus, continue to grow us up. Surround us, Jesus, with people, believers, who will encourage us and teach us and support us and pray with us. We love you, Jesus. We pray that you would bring those encouragers into our lives, maybe even this week. And we pray, Jesus, that our expectation that you will show up would be fulfilled this week. Jesus, thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for your grace, giving us another chance. Thank you for believing in us, being faithful to us. We give our hearts, our minds, our souls to you. Forgive us when we've relied on ourselves more than we've relied on you. But this week, grow us up a little more. We ask it in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.